Module 9, the epigenome. The term epigenetics has been defined in variable ways. The components of the word are derived from the Greek term epi, which means above or in addition to, and genesis, which means origin, or in the common biological context, genetics means relating to genes. Epigenetic regulation is the process by which genes in the body are permanently silenced as part of cellular differentiation. It refers to the chemical modifications of the genome that result from alterations in the environment. And more recently, epigenetics involves the study of heritable changes in gene function and gene silencing that occur without a change in DNA sequence. In 1956, Conrad Waddington proposed the term epigenetics to describe how organisms develop through both the action of genes and the influence of the environment. Waddington conducted experiments in which he demonstrated that heat shock or exposure to ether in the early stages of development could result in reproducible changes in the developmental morphology of fruit flies that could then be passed down to subsequent generations. He called this process genetic assimilation, and he proposed that it resulted from both the environmental modification of the genome as well as the genomic sequence itself. He compared development to marbles rolling down a variable surface and suggested that once a cell hit an environmental landmark and began down a given path, its fate was fixed. In any given cell, only a small percentage of the genes are expressed. The vast majority of the genome has to be shut down or silenced in order for the cell to differentiate. Knowing which genes to keep on and which ones to silence is critical for a cell to survive and proliferate normally. Here you can see the derivation from an embryonic stem cell, which is completely pluripotent and can form any cell in the body, how early differentiation results in the three different main tissue types, mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm, and how from those tissue types, many, many different kinds of cells can result. It seems almost incredible that a sperm and an egg, each carrying half of a full genome, can combine to form that complete genome in a single embryo, and through the process of differentiation, create more than 200 different cell types in the case of human development. In the 1960s, John Gurdon performed the first nuclear transfer experiments in which he injected the nuclei of mature intestinal frog cells into enucleated egg cells and showed that a fully mature organism could form, thus creating a clone of the original adult organism and demonstrating that a fully differentiated cell could be de-differentiated to become pluripotent again and all the instructions for determining cell differentiation were present in the artificially nucleated egg. He found that this transformation occurred more readily the younger the organism from which the mature nuclei were extracted. The techniques he developed were later modified and used to create the clone sheep Dolly, the most famous sheep in the world, and he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2012 for his discovery of nuclear transfer. Ultimately, dedifferentiation involves reprogramming of the epigenome. It was studies performed by Mary Lyon on X inactivation that suggested a mechanism existed to silence genes. When looking at X chromosomes under a microscope, she found that one copy of the X chromosome appeared to be shrunken and dark. These bar bodies which were first observed by Murray Barr in 1949, represented completely inactivated chromosomes in which the DNA sequence was intact. In the case of X inactivation, females receive an X chromosome from each of their parents, and one copy of each X chromosome is randomly silenced in order to balance gene dose for those genes that are present on the X chromosome. The origin of the inactivated X chromosome whether paternal or maternal, is random within each cell, and it usually has no visible effect. In the case of calico cats, heterozygotes for coat color 
for a coat color gene that resides on the X chromosome will appear mottled due to the random inactivation of the maternal or paternal gene. Mary Lyon knew that since the DNA sequence was unchanged, there had to be some kind of epigenetic regulation involved in this process. Two processes were later identified that could induce gene silencing, methylation and histone modification. And as you can see in this figure, where at the bottom is a completely condensed and compacted chromosome, and as you rise to the top of the figure, you see the open DNA sequence, methylation occurs at the DNA sequence itself, while histone modification refers to alterations in the histone proteins that act to bind the DNA within the chromosome. As you learned in molecular nutrition when you studied one carbon metabolism, diet plays a major role in DNA methylation. Dietary sources of folate and vitamin B12, including green leafy vegetables, meats and eggs, legumes, citrus fruits, nuts and seeds, avocados, bananas, and fortified grains, provide major sources of nutrients required for the DNA methylation pathway to proceed. Note that folate, meta folate metabolism is also critical for nucleotide synthesis, which is why folate is so important for normal development and growth, and why folate is often added to as an extra component of a diet of pregnant women. Folate is the precursor of tetrahydrofolate, which is then converted to methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is a methyl donor and a cofactor in many reactions. Through the action of methionine synthase, which requires vitamin B12 as a cofactor, methionine is synthesized and ultimately converted to S-adenosyl methionine, or SAM. SAM participates in the synthesis and degradation of catecholamines and melatonin, but it also plays a key role in DNA methylation. The methyl group attached to SAM is highly reactive and can be transferred easily to other molecules via a series of specialized methyl transferases. There are three major types of DNA methyl transferases, or DNMTs for short, DNMT1, DNMT3A, and DNMT3B. These methyl transferases facilitate the transfer of the reactive methyl group on SAM to a cytosine nucleotide, converting it to methyl cytosine. DNMT3A and 3B are responsible for de novo methylation that occurs as an embryo develops, allowing for differentiation of cells into specific cell types by selectively silencing genes in each cell type. DNMT1 is responsible for maintaining the methylation patterns as cells replicate and divide. DNA, methyla DNA methylation has long been correlated with the repression of gene expression and DNA methylation mostly occurs on CPG nucleotides, which are islands of C's and G's found throughout the genome. So how does methylation silence genes? One hypothesis is that the methyl group disrupts the minor groove of DNA and sterically hinders transcription factor binding. But this is only true for some, but not all, transcription factors. More often, methylation recruits DNA binding proteins that mediate repression of genes. These binding proteins appear to recruit histone deacetylases leading to the remodeling of chromatin. In terms of histone modification as an epigenetic mechanism, supercoiled DNA normally resides in nucleosomes, which consist of 146 base pairs of DNA wrapped around eight histones. The supercoiled closed structure of DNA is maintained through methylation of specific lysine residues 9 and 27 on the H3 histone protein by histone methyltransferases and removal of acetyl groups from the histones within the nucleosome cluster through histone deacetylase or HDAC. To activate transcription or DNA replication, histone acetyltransferase or HAT adds an acetyl group to the amino terminal tails of the histones, allowing the DNA to unwrap and unwind and replicate. Transcriptionally active chromatin regions tend to be hyperacetylated and hypomethylated. 
If a region of, of DNA or a gene is destined for silencing, chromatin remodeling enzymes, such as histone deacetylases and ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers, begin the gene silencing process. One or more of these activities may recruit DNA methyltransferase, resulting in DNA methylation, followed finally by recruitment of the methyl CPG binding proteins. The region of DNA will then be heritably maintained in an inactive state. There are many, many ways in which histones proteins can be modified. Acetylation and methylation are primary ones, but ubiquitination, sumylation, and phosphorylation can variably affect the activity and the binding and sequestration of DNA by histone proteins. Other types of epigenetic regulation include modification by non-coding RNAs and modification by pioneer transcription factors, but we won't cover either of these in this lesson in great detail. Epigenetic modification, as we've seen, plays a very important role in cell differentiation. As you'll see in an upcoming video, only four genes are required to restore cells to their pluripotent state, as scientists discovered when they created inducible pluripotent stem cells. These four genes are OCT3-4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, and the discovery that only four genes were needed to restore their expression and restore pluripotent state was really exciting. Epigenetic modification provides a mean to means to increase the complexity of our genome in response to environmental influences. In the videos that uh, comprise the rest of this lesson, you'll get a little bit more detail on each of the things that we discussed in this particular overview um, video and uh, some information that you can use for your module project.